What do you think when we're talking about the distinction between defaulting to the IMF or yeah. the ECB? Well, uh, it certainly makes a big difference. I think, you know, it's, is it really even a default given that there's not private creditors involved? The rating agency says it doesn't really count as a default. So people use the term very loosely um, when it's not actually, this, you know, there's no really private creditors out there. So it's kind of a default in that they haven't paid, but not default in the sense that we typically think about it. But you're absolutely right. The IMF, they have a 30-day grace period if they don't make the payment. You know, not good politically, but we don't think it really is going to be so catastrophic. I think it really is that mid-July deadline that is the one that they have to keep to. Something has to be done by them because, yes, you can't not pay the ECB and expect to get any money back from them. You know, right now the markets are basically saying, you know what, we don't really care. We're not yeah, really watching true. you at all. We're not interested in Greece anymore. Um, I think the big mystery and question mark is... How much could there be contagion, right? I mean, what happens if some of the Greek companies that have borrowed money from banks throughout Europe right. start defaulting? This could become a problem. So that's a big question mark still. And also, if someone in Greece buys a truck from Germany, I mean, there's a, there's a paper trail there, right? So at some point, the Bank of Greece actually owes the Bank of Germany money to pay for that car, and that has to be paid for at some point. I mean, I've read targets of about 115 billion euros are kind of on the hook, uh, 99 billion in terms of that kind of target to money. Jargon. Well, but, like but, but honestly, Things. I mean, it's just amazing <laughs> that there's been absolutely no concern in debt markets, equity markets, you name it. Like, people are really sanguine right now. Are they just sick of it? Dan, what do you think? Do you think markets are too sanguine about it? But Euro was like up today, right? Yeah. And then it was flat? I think it just shows implicitly that the markets realize that they have to come to a deal. There's just too much to lose on both sides. Uh, and I think the other thing to keep in mind is that the distance separating them is really not that large. I mean, it seems like it's significant. It certainly played up in the press as if it is. The rhetoric's got quite heated. Uh, but we're talking numbers that are certainly bridgeable. So it's who has to come in so a little bit. So it sounds bit. like you think a deal will get done. Uh, yes, we do. Absolutely. But talking to Lisa's point, I was at a hedge fund event yesterday, and I was talking to them about, hey, you know, do you even care about Greece? Because I talk about it every day for, like, hours. They're like, honestly, <laughs> not really. Like, we don't have any bets on Greece. But if something happens catastrophic to Greece and markets don't move or they go higher, that is an incredibly bullish sign for asset classes. I thought that was a really interesting take. Well, right. And that's one way to possibly interpret what's been going on with the market movement or lack thereof is this people basically just saying look even if you default so much has changed since 2012 you know really the risk has been so isolated to uh, really the the European members that have the finance ministers that have lent the money that it's not going to cause this catastrophic contagion you know is that essentially what the market's saying or is the market just fooling itself and that is actually a question I just want to point out to your whichever hedge fund guy you're talking to that <laughs> In 2011, during the debt ceiling fight, there was a lot of nervousness, and then they got the deal, and then there was a big sell-off late in the summer, basically after the deal. So you never know how these things work. Like, sometimes you well, think, like, oh, there's this nervousness, but sometimes markets go in a different direction well, than true. would be intuitive. His point specifically was that he didn't have a bet on Greece or not. Sure. It's not like he was in, like, bank stocks in Greece yeah. or anything like that. It was more of a... A, a macro field, but you're right. It could be a sort of a buy the rumor, sell the news right. kind of situation that we tend to wind up seeing as well. Well, I think your point, though, that them not having a position is broadly true. I mean, who owns green stocks these days? Who owns the debt? I think that's another reason you don't see the impact in the markets is because people don't own them. They're not buying and selling them based on the news. It is going to be pretty contained. That said, I was just talking to a very big money manager who said, who's a credit money manager, and he said that he is the most bearish on the market and is the most defensively positioned since the credit crisis. Hmm. So there is certainly this concern and he is not the only one who I've talked to who said recently they've been moving up in the credit spectrum in other words buying safer assets buying bond, bonds backed by actually stuff rather than yeah. theories you know I mean it's like <laughs> trying to trying to make sure that you're insulated if so to that happen. point B of A was out with a point today saying we're seeing some of the biggest outflows from credit funds since the taper tantrum yeah well and putting that in perspective six billion dollars of outflows in fixed income in one week yeah. yeah, that's all I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> right, and this was, this was largely um, sovereign debt funds, particularly European sovereign debt funds. There has been incredible volatility, particularly the 30-year uh, German boond and the 10-year 10-year uh, boond. You're talking a 25% decline in value, you know, in one, in a couple weeks. I mean, this is dramatic. This is really uh, life, uh, once-in-a-lifetime types of moves. So people are watching this, and they're getting Isn't skittish. is like, by the math, like once in six billion years, uh, <laughs> 
odds that this is <laughs> supposed she's to happen. So excited. Like this. That's why I'm so excited. So, You'll get this but, chance. But in six is years. there a cross asset correlation? We haven't seen that. We've seen a lot of inflows into European equities, for example, and into the stocks versus a credit market. I mean, what do you see as the risk there, Dan? Well, I think certainly we've seen a lot of that on the fixed income side. Everyone that assumed that quantitative easing out of the ECB was a one-way bet. You just bought it. We were going to ride negative territory, no limits, and you know clearly that wasn't the case. And so I think that explains a lot of this outflow uh, that you've seen that people have realized that they're not going to make so much money as they thought. So I think that's I think the focus on the fixed income side. I think on the equity side, our view is that you know if we do see and probably will see some more of a sell-off within European equities, we're not expecting to deal on Monday. This is going to drag on, but if that happens, it's a buying opportunity because right. the outlook test actually and, is positive. And, and talking about that, let's get sort of a look ahead at what we're looking at next week. It's mm -hmm. not just Greece on Monday, right? There are a lot of other eco events to pay attention to as well. Uh, on Tuesday, we get flash PMIs from not just China, but the U.S. and Euro as well. Uh, we also have earnings from BlackBerry. I mean, that's always kind of exciting. Uh, <laughs> Wednesday, we also have earnings from Lennar and Monsanto. Lennar particularly important in terms of a home builder context. And Thursday, personal income and spending. Also, the PCE in May, and that's really what the Fed looks at when it comes to inflation mm -hmm. uh, what gets you guys excited well I'm just excited for like the idea like back in the day during the crisis we have these weekends and they're like can we get a deal before Asian markets open and that was just so fun and of course they never did nor did it ever matter and I kind of feel like we're getting back to this like oh this w crucial weekend what will what will happen before New Zealand opens up Sunday afternoon. It kind of is like well, a little bit of a uh, flashback well, to the good old days. I love you say that because the New Zealand financial minister came out today and was like, we are ground zero for what's happening in Greece when markets open on Sunday. I thought that, that was such great context. I think what's going to be important, you talked about a lot of the economic data that's coming out next week. I think we're going to see more of a disconnect perhaps between the economic numbers, which I think are broadly speaking going to be positive. We think the U.S. economy is doing well. Uh, and what you're going to see in the equity market, right? I think we've already gotten the benefits from that recovery in U.S. equities through, say, April of this year. So we may not see such a positive reaction in U.S. equities because, of course, the implication is higher interest rates than we're necessarily going to see with the good economic numbers. I'm, I'm looking at inflation. I think the inflation data is going to be key. I think that it's all about inflation right now. I think the Fed says they're interested in employment. I think that their eye is really toward inflation right now. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, every point of data is going to be a market mover more than anything the Fed could say at this point. So I think that, you know, watch for volatility and watch for sort of big swings. Yeah, and wage inflation in particular. We like yeah. it.